Hi, everyone. Hi. All right, you guys do live. It's awesome. So, who am I? Uh, what I do already? Oh, yeah, that might work. I, I'm I'm gonna like move like this. And, all right, I'll try to stand still for you. Okay, I'll I'll try to stand still and won't move around. Kind of beats defeats what I do, but all right. So who am I? My name is Josh Kelly. I'm a security engineer at a Fortune 1000 company. I think it's safe to say that I work for Diebold, so that's really where I work at. Uh, I work for uh, Dave Kennedy, Relic, so he's my boss. So he convinces me to do all this stuff all the time. Um, because of him, though, I've, I've been able to speak at Black Hat, DEF CON, B-Sides, uh, Las Vegas, and uh, local Northeast Ohio uh, security events as well. Um, some of my code that I've done uh, has been included in the social engineering toolkit. Uh, it's also been released on uh, SecManiac, some of the other stuff I do. Um, David adds to SecManiac, so he always credits me and stuff like that, so he doesn't try to take credit for it. But um, I like to hit people. I like to hit people specifically with sticks. So if you're ever interested in getting hit, let me know. I'll punch you. I'll hit you with a stick. I'll do anything. Ask some of my coworkers. Um, and you can follow me uh, on Twitter, Winfang98. I really lurk a lot. I post very little. But sometimes I post stuff, and it's interesting. So infectious media, really, um, this is going over the hit stuff. I know you guys are probably tired to death of the 10C and hearing about it and all that stuff. So that's why I was trying to bring some new stuff to it. But I'm, first, before I do that, I'm going to try to recap some of the stuff that's out there and maybe some of the stuff you guys haven't heard all about. So in case you didn't know, uh, Adrian Crenshaw, who just walked out of the room, Iron Geek, he's the guy that really brought light to the HID first. There was some stuff on Hack 5 about the HID as well, um, but Adrian's the one that's been going around the talks and doing stuff like that. I got a chance to speak on it at DEF CON last year uh, and at B-Sides uh, Las Vegas this year as well. So a lot of times, a lot of the talks before uh, the DEF CON talk, were just conceptualizations, what can we do with this, what could be cool with this, stuff like that. Well, what Relic and I did at DEF CON last year was we actually weaponized it and we took it into pen tests and we used the thing and we actually were able to get some success with it. Um, now what's really interesting is if you go to Hack5, they have their rubber ducky, which isn't necessarily a tensy, but it's the same concept. It's still a hit device. You can still program it, put some stuff up there, and have it type out automatically for you. So you can go to Hack5's website, you can go to Hack5's booth out there, you can pick them up, and you get a cool little rubber ducky that doesn't float. Uh, but the, essentially what the HID does is it emulates a keyboard. So you're allowed to type in things, you put it into the program, you type it out, and it'll type up on the screen, and it allows you to really like script uh, commands that would normally have been a pain to type out. In case you haven't seen it, that's what a Tensi looks like. I'm pretty sure everyone's seen those things. But the thing is, though, now the Tensi is for the DIY person. This is for the do-it-yourself guy. This isn't, you know, this isn't the one you go buy from Hack5 and just everything works for you. You have to get in there. You, you're going to have to code this thing. You're going to have to do some soldering and stuff like that. I've got one right here that I've got on a breadboard with my SD card adapter on it. This is, I, I end up playing with them like this. I, we do a lot more with these things than just this. If you uh, came to the talk yesterday that Rob Simon gave, KC57, uh, we used a Tensi there with X10 to be able to jam X10 signals. So really into DIY stuff with this. So the different attack vectors that you guys have heard with, the ten, with these type of devices are you plug it in, you add domain admin, you do these real simple commands, net use commands, stuff like that. Stuff that just kind of gets you access to things. One of the things that we demonstrated though at DEF CON last year was the ability to type out an actual exploit. So what we took was we took an HTML, uh, we took a IE heap spray exploit, typed out the entire HTML for it, put it on the system, executed in, uh, Internet Explorer, and then executed that page, and we were able to compromise the machine through that. Uh, other things that we showed off were reversing uh, shells and other scripts that we could write. So we did a PowerShell script that created a reverse shell that immediately contacted back to the server. It was maybe about 20 lines of uh, PowerShell code, real simple. 
Uh, do, you can do the same thing on Linux and you can do the same thing on OSX using Netcat and stuff like that and it's even easier. But the big thing was is that we had fun with it too. We were able to screw with coworkers. I don't know if you guys have heard the story about the one coworker I have that we decided to see how test my soldering skills and test my ability to conceal things by putting it inside of his keyboard. So we put it inside of his keyboard and there's the actual code that we put on there and it was just a mouse moves around every 30 seconds or so and clicks a button. We let it sit in his, in his keyboard for a week without telling him about it and our help desk ended up hating us more than this guy hated us because he contacted the help desk constantly. He was going to the help desk, I need my, because it was the mouse moving around, so he's like, I need a new mouse. You guys gotta give me a new mouse, so they give him a new mouse. Then he's like, it's not the mouse, it's gotta be the docking station, give me a new docking station. So he got a new docking station, still going on. They're like, well, we don't know what it is. Well, it's the help desk, so what they tell you to do, re-image the computer. So they re-image the computer, that's not working for him. He's still getting frustrated, he's tearing out his hair, he's already bald anyway, so he's tearing out what little he has left. And he's just like, fine, just give me a new computer, ah! So he gets the new computer, and it's still going on for him. He's just, he, he's completely lost his mind, he doesn't know what's going on. He hasn't, nev he's never tried to replace the keyboard the entire time. Uh, and what's worse is we've got a guy sitting right next to him who was with me when I was put it in and you know, he helped keep him away from this desk so I could put it there. And he's constantly going to this, my other coworker and he's like, Ryan, Ryan, what's up? I don't know what's wrong with this. Please tell me, you know, help me out. You worked on the help desk. And he's just like, did you try the mouse? And that's it. That's all he would say to the guy. He was just like, I think he was going to strangle him too after he found out what happened. So this was all in a practical joke for our CSO though. This was going to be a, a phenomenal practical joke on him and I was going to lose my job for it if I did it. So Dave came in one day after a week of this going on, saw that I had still left it there and I had no plans on telling him what was going on. Decided that I, he, needed to, he needed to get rid of, I needed to get rid of the keyboard for him. So he pulled him into his office, talked to him about an hour about databases and all sorts of stuff and that stuff you know, makes this guy giddy. So he's giddy talking about database security, and so I go switch out the keyboard and everything like that, because in reality, I didn't want to lose the Tensi device. So I, I didn't want to lose the $16 device I bought on the internet, and I have like hundreds of. So he gets that, and Dave, you know, Dave finishes talking to him, and you know, he comes back, and everything's working fine for him. He breathes a sigh of relief. A week later, someone told him what happened, and the guy hasn't talked to me since. I know, it's not a bad thing at all. Actually, it's really good. I don't have to hear about database security every single day. It's really nice to hear. So, but that's one thing you can do with the Tensi. I'm sure you've seen you know, people put them in mouses and stuff like that and do all sorts of other cool things with them. But uh, something else I heard you know, people are doing, they're using these Tensi devices to jiggle the mouse every five seconds or so. So that way, they don't have to worry about their screensaver because Lord knows, you don't want that poor sysadmin having to have a screensaver and having to go log on and type his password again every time he walks away from his computer. You know, as a security practitioner, I don't want him to have to do that. So I don't have to send funny emails from his account and switch his screens up and do all sorts of stuff like that to him. But you can also do it embedded into a presence for family and friends and stuff like that. You know, Adrian did some stuff where he put it in all sorts of things and I saw something on Hackaday where someone used one for a LED mohawk on a Viking helmet. So these things are fun. You can do a lot of interesting stuff with them. But the more less the less common attack vectors and the more lethal attack vectors are really it's the you can brute force a council log on. Everyone knows on Windows if you have the council up on the screen and you try to log on to it and fail and try to log on to it again and fail and again and fail and again and fail and again it's not going to lock you out. It doesn't care what your group policy says. It's not going to lock you out. You're at the council. So since this attack vector is being having physical access, you plug this in. Well, this means now I can brute force your password. Okay, now it's a viable way to brute force a Windows password at the council. Inline keyboard logger slash injection. What's really interesting about this is that with these devices, you can intercept all the keyboard commands coming in record them, log them to another device like an SD card, and then replay them back to the computer as if it was typed in. 
So the user never really sees anything. Well, what's interesting is, okay, let's say we, we don't see any activity for five minutes. Okay, great. We'll keep it alive. We don't see any activity for 10 minutes. Okay, we're pretty sure this guy's at lunch or something like that. Now we can start interjecting our payload into the system. We can start you know, adding domain admin accounts, adding local admin accounts, stuff like that. Create that back door so we have a shell on that system. So it's really nice when you get that nice keyboard or mouse or whatever from your vendor. It's like, here, use my keyboard. It's a great way to get that in there. Also, uh, Ohio State kid, he's really flicking off uh, USB bypassing or USB filtering. Because there's no way you can prevent it. When you can control what you're sending to the computer, most like products like SEP will restrict you based on VID and PID. So the, the VID and the PID of a Dell keyboard is right there. So all I have to do is go into the header file in the library, change this one area right here where it says vendor ID and product ID, and then now I'm using a Dell keyboard. Anyone ever plugged in a non-Apple keyboard into their Mac? and had that stupid control screen pop up, press the control button, press this, press that. It's annoying as hell. So what you do is you change it to be an Apple keyboard. Never comes up again. No way anyone's gonna know what you're plugging in now because it's never gonna tell the truth. The VID and the PID that's in that code right there, that's what Tensi initially puts in, so it's nothing really interesting. But what's really interesting though is where uh, I saw this picture over in China we were over in China, we were doing some stuff there, and I saw uh, some of their twists that they had done to this. So everyone knows that the Chinese, you know, they're doing all this hacking stuff constantly, and they're doing, they've got their creative spins on it. So, I mean, this is how they dress this one up as. So we sent Relic over to China, and um, they dressed him up, unfortunately. That's traditional uh, wedding ceremony garb that they wear over there, and that, he is the bride in this picture. I don't want to show you the other face because the guy, I don't know if he'll kill me or not, but he probably would. Um, but yeah, so that's what Relic does in his free time if he's not on the computer. He has tried to pwn me so many times in presentations and have pictures of me doing all sorts of weird shit. I'm trying to get him back now. So, so a lot of the stuff we do with the hit is we put out there scripts. We do simple commands. So it's nothing that great. It's just basically a macro for us. Well, this year we decided, okay, let's go beyond just this macro, just this scripts, just stuff like that. Let's actually take executables and let's start placing them on the systems. But to do that, to place an executable on the system, we need to have the executable in a format that's easy to read, easy to understand, and easy to type out. So we need to start converting these. I mean, as you can see, an executable normally, if you just type it out on Windows, looks like complete and utter trash, and you can't type that through a keyboard at all. Uh, has anyone ever found this you know, smiley face key on their keyboard? You don't count, no, uh, it doesn't count. Just because you know ASCII, you, you can't do it. So, but you can't really do it very easily. It's, it's painful, it's hard, it just takes forever. So the easier way to do it is really to go through and change the files into a hex format or base64 format, or base64. So what we ended up doing was we changed it to hexed. But the problem was is that the Tensi devices don't have a lot of room on there. The actual room where you can store strings at on a Tensi device is 2K. That's not a lot of room. And if you're trying to copy up even the smallest of shells to a, in a system, 2K is not enough. So what we had to do was we had to use a library called PGM space. Now, this is specific for AVR microcontrollers. Um, what, this space, what this library does is actually moves the file, or moves your strings from the flash memory where you have 127K or 32K, depending on what um, device you're using, and it allows you to move it from there and put it up into the, the running memory. So this way you can move large strings around. This is just a real simple program up here demonstrating how it's used. But uh, if you actually take a look at some of the code that's in set, you can see that we store th hundreds of thousands of lines in there. So we are able to fill up the memory space on a Tensi device, even the large Tensi devices, and move it around. So that's really key to be able to copy files to and from the system, actually only to the system, really. 
So what about a shell? I know that the, um, the Hack5 guys, they have a shell on theirs, and it's about 1.4K. It takes 10 minutes to type out. So it's, it's big, and it takes forever to type out. We found a shell that's 804 bytes. So that's actually the, all the source code there, uh, right there. And as you can see, when I looked at it on my Mac, it was just 804 bytes. If anyone's interested, then go to the website there, tarasco.org slash security slash you know, tiny underscore bind shell. They can download this bind shell. You can use it for whatever application you want. I thought it was just a really cool find. It was something awesome that I wanted to share with people. But we do leverage this. We put it into the 10C and we can, we can execute a bind shell and we're, you know, we're solid. But really, a simple bind shell doesn't do it for us. So what we need, we need the Swiss Army knife of payloads. We need Meterpreter. So trying to really condense down Meterpreter as much as possible, you know, you run MSF payload and then you throw it through UPX and this is what you get. You can get a packed executable that's 47K. That's pretty small for a payload, that's, and for, especially for Meterpreter, which is great. But there's a problem with that, and the problem is, is that the Meterpreter payload is 47K, but the Tensi, the small Tensi devices, the one that I showed you the picture of earlier on, is only supports 32K. And you have to also include your program in there to copy the file out. And it's really painful. And when you do the conversion to hex, it's gonna be larger. So the, the little tiny Tensi's out, so you're not gonna have a nice little small form factor. So you need to go with the larger Tensi, which will give you 127K, but the form factor is a little bit bigger, but it's still easy to hide. So being able to convert an EXE to hex is that simple. Three lines. Import bin ASCII, open the file, print out the bin ASCII through Hexify. There's nothing more to it. That, that will produce a hex, ver a hex representation of your binary. So once we do that, we get the binary that we want. We've put through Hexify. We've got it now a typable payload. We need to be able to convert that hex back over to a binary on the Windows machine or on whatever machine that we're using. So to do that, we need to be, you know, we need to use Python again, if it's a Linux or an OS X box, Perl. Um, but on Windows, we end up having to use Visual Basic scripts or PowerShell. So inside of set, there's already this done for PowerShell and for Python. So you can do this on OS X and you can do this also on Windows. But what about the really large files? And I mean the really, really large files. That's her lunch, by the way. Yeah, that's her lunch. If you're in this room right now and this is you in the picture, I'm very sorry. I didn't know what you, who you were. I just Googled you. So, so the thing is, the Tensi Plus Plus or 2.0 Plus Plus, it only supports 127K of memory. So even still, 127K isn't a lot to deal with. So you really have to, you know, compress your files down and do stuff like that. And, and when you start converting files into hex and into base64 representations, it increases the size of the file. So it's extremely painful. So the thing is, though, is that you can do an SD card with the 10C. It's really easy to do. It's not that hard. Um, and the libraries are already there. So now the file size is only limited to the SD card. So if you've got a 2 gig SD card, you can have a 2 gig file. You know, 512 meg SD card, because I have lots of those laying around. You know, 512 megs, that's how big of a file I can do. So that makes it a lot easier. But there's a little bit of a problem with, uh, with using this and using it as a HID device. So using it as a HID device, we're limited by the operating system. The operating system, theoretically, will only support 500 keystrokes per second. And, most, and some operating systems even limit that further because of the, the frames that are sending. It limits them down to 62.5 frames a second, or keystrokes a second. That's really, really freaking slow. I think I can get carrier pigeons that travel faster than that. So, but that's all theoretical, and when you actually do this, it's even slower. So I actually had to type, put in like 80, sec, 80 millisecond delays into the keystrokes just so I could make sure I could time everything right. 
So I'll actually show you some of the, uh, the code here. So for those of you that are not familiar, this is uh, Arduino. This is the IDE for it. Um, a lot of programming, uh, a lot of the stuff that if you're using SET or if you're using some of the stuff on the internet that you download, you're going to be using this in here. Give me a second. Let me take a look to see where this is at. So here's um, here what you see here is we're actually opening up a file off the SD card called converts.txt. And what we do, trying to remember what we do. So we open up the converts.txt. We take a look to see if the data file really exists. And then what we do is we take a look at the size of the data file, and then we start doing using the, um, we just start printing it out byte for byte, the byte representation of the data file to the, to the computer through the keyboard. So it's really easy. It's not that hard. Uh, it's pretty simple. But what you see there, though, is you see this delay 10. This delay 10 was required because while we were typing this out, either the speed of the processor on the microcontroller or the speed at which my Mac accepted the keystrokes was highly limited. So it ended up being that I needed to delay it 10 microseconds, or 10 cycles is really what delay does it in. It's a cycle of the microcontroller. Uh, I had to delay it 10 times just to allow the text to be typed out in a normal fashion and to be usable. If this wasn't in there, the text gets typed out so fast that it gets lost in its buffer and it gets overwritten, and it won't be able to copy to the system correctly. So here you can see how easy it is to type out that Python script to convert the file from, e from hex to exe. Actually, in this, it's not exe. It's for Mac. So all we do is just unhexify. So that's the problem that we run into with the SD cards. They work, but if we're doing really large files, if we're trying to do anything more than a few K of files, it's not going to go fast. It's going to be a pain in the butt. You're going to end up sitting there for 10, 15 minutes. I've even had some files on there that I timed in hours. That's how long it took to type out these files. So it's not really a, a very practical method to do if you're trying to do anything large. So there was a solution for that that I found. I found if we use the serial libraries inside the 10C, that works a lot faster. That it's bi-directional, and its drivers are on all the OSs. So what we can do now is instead of just relying on the 10C to download files, we can upload files as well. Not only that, but we can also look around to see what's on our SD card, and we can actually interact with our SD card as if it was a USB drive. But it's not enumerated as a USB drive. It's now enumerated, in this case, as a USB serial modem. Most people aren't blocking USB serial modems, so it's pretty easy to get around that. So why is it better? Again, bypassing device control. You can upload download files, faster transfer files. So what I did was I wrote an interactive shell to work with the Tensi device as a serial drive in a serial mode so I can upload and download files from there. So one of the problems is, is that I need to be able to enumerate the device as a serial device or as a hid device first so I can copy my interactive shell program, which is only maybe 100 lines of code or something like that. I'll show you here in a second. But I need to be able to enumerate as a hid device first, then shut it off essentially, re-enumerate it as a serial device, and then open up this channel between the two. So unfortunately, I didn't get a lot of time to work on that part of it, because uh, since Defcon and B-Sides, when I, we first talked about this, uh, I had a baby between then. I didn't have a baby personally. <laughs> but my wife had a, 
had a baby, so we have a three-week-old at home, and if anyone has kids, they know how you never sleep. So I'm here, this is my vacation, and I've been able to sleep. It's been awesome. So, but the other thing, too, to use this interactive shell, you need to know what devices are re restricted and aren't restricted. But in most cases, they're not really doing the full-blown restriction of, this thing, of things, so it's not that big of a deal. So let me go ahead and show you the interactive shell. Great, turned on Mary and now it's everything screwed. Okay. So here's the interactive shell. It's not a lot of the lines of code, and I'm not a great programmer, so by all means, you know, someone else can look at this and say, wow, that's a giant piece of shit. I'd agree with you. It is. But the big thing is here is that it supports uploading files, downloading files, clearing out the buffer, and just doing file directory listings. So, I mean, if someone has more time and devotion to this, they're, able, they're going to be able to create a graphical user interface that automatically pops up. And so once it pops up, you can sit there, you know, plug this thing in, boom, now you have an interactive shell or a graphical user interface that you can copy and files up, download files, upload files, do all that great stuff. So it's a lot easier to work with. So, you know, why are people even bothering trying to restrict USB devices like thumb drives and stuff like that when you can get around it now? There's also the other side to it, which is the which is on the Arduino or on the Tensi device itself. So all we have to do on this is just include the SD libraries. We initialize the card. And then basically, I mean, if we can sit there, take in LS or DIR, we'll do a directory listing. Get, we get files. It's pretty simple stuff. So it's not a lot of complexity in there. So it's very easy for someone to do. What's up? Yeah, no problem. As long as I didn't do it. I mean. You can't have it act like a network device. If you actually look at the Arduino uh, source code, you will see that when it's in a hid mode, um, it will act as uh, the serial monitor actually communicates over the network. So it creates a port on local host, and that's how you're able to still monitor the serial and do your hid interaction with the computer. So, but as for creating it as a network device itself, um, if you have the, the libraries exist for it, so you can definitely do it. You just need to have the hardware. So, is there any other questions while Adrian and Dave are trying to fix this? Yeah, we have the possibility of getting some reasons why the conference. What? Actually, it's someone who puts a point in the talk, I'm sorry, Matt. We had issues. Do it again? <laughs> Don't boo me, please. Don't boo me. Boo those guys. So part two. I can do it at Neo InfoSec. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we can do it at Neo InfoSec. That's not a problem. Uh, we could try for. Okay. Do we need to go through the slides again, or? Okay. Yeah. Because I was going to say I've only got uh, like 15 minutes left or 20 minutes left. Okay. Yeah, so I have the. Now, yes, you can use two tensies. 
that's perfect, that, that works. But the thing is though, is that you're using two tensies, you're using two USB slots. You want to try to, I want to try to condense this down as much as possible. I want to try to make it in one device. So um, if we take a look here, Two tensies. Um, I have one tensy here, and then I have another one I plug in. So, like I said, I just had a baby, or my wife had a baby, so I haven't got to the, that point where I got that done. But, I'm sorry? Absolutely. Of course I feel like I'm the one that had the baby. I don't know what childbirth is, so, I don't know. I go to the bathroom, I feel like I have a baby. I mean. <laughs> so what there, what goes on though in these uh, in these libraries is that we do a, a USB init, and in that USB init, we're actually communicating over the USB protocol. Uh, which I'm not really familiar with, I'm not really great with, so me and uh, one of my guys at work, uh, Rob, we sat there and we looked at this thing for two days straight, trying to figure out and understand really what's going on and everything like that. And this stuff is confusing as hell because we are not hardware guys. You know, we, we just sit there and try to do things to make things work. So, but in here, I mean, we, we found out so much stuff about this stuff. Uh, you know, we, what it comes down to is that basically there's an event with the USB device, and that's what this IRSR is right here. There's an event with the USB device, this interrupt, that happens when you plug in the device. So in this ISR, it initializes your USB device upon seeing power. And then there's a, another one down here a little bit further, USB ComVec, that initializes that enumerates again when you uh, have your first communication. So what, we, what we've been working on, what we're still working on, is trying to see if we can lie to the system and get these interrupts to be changed again for us. Um, we haven't been successful very so far, uh, but we're still working on it. This is where, really where I need to sit down, buckle down, and look at the USB protocol. Uh, read that whole document and see if this is even possible. Because if it's not possible, then I need to go the USB hub route and just have a USB hub tied in, and that will be able to do everything I need. Thank you, Adrian, for that idea, though. Good news, we may actually have to put part. We didn't have a segment where we have the frame dropped out of the slide. So, so awesome. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in the device that I have here to kind of give you an idea of what is capable. Let's go ahead and connect this to my Mac. So here's my interactive shell that I developed for the SD card. So this will work on any Tensi device that has an SD card. Or actually, this will work on any Arduino-based device that has an SD card. As long as it's enumerating as a USB serial device at the moment, um, on a Mac, it enumerates in dev slash either tty.usb modem12341 or as um, cu.usb modem.12341. Uh, as long as it enumerates as one of those two, you can go ahead and use this. I mean, or you can just change the variable inside the program itself and do it too. So here, I go ahead and type in ls. I can try that again. There. So it's, it's glitchy. I put this together kind of last minute to kind of show you guys things. But this is the contents of what's on my USB, or on my SD card. So there's a converts.txt file, serial.sh, and stuff like that. So in this directory here, nothing's in here. So here, I'm able to get serial.sh. So now I've gone ahead and copied 80 bytes over. In reality, I truncate the last byte of this because it's a, it's a FF, it's just stupid. I hate it, so. But there's my serial.sh file that I copied over. So that's all that it is. Um, 
that's how easy, in the serial.sh file, this is also how you can just read from this, uh, the serial device in bash as well. It's pretty simple, pretty easy. So you can see that there's this larger file here called converts.txt. So it takes a little bit of time because we have to wait for the buffer to fill back up. Uh, the buffer only supports uh, 1,024 bytes at a time, so we need to you know, fill the buffer up, clear it out, do all that stuff. Anyone that's done any networking type stuff knows about that. So there's our text file, and this text file is actually just a uh, hex file so that we used in the demonstration at B-Sides. So when I was able to get this, it made me happy. It made me like silly happy. So I'll show you how happy it made me. And when I mean when I mean silly happy, I, I started dancing. I wanted to dance like a oh god, I don't know what I wanted to dance like. I wanted to kind of dance like this. <laughs> That's how much I wanted to dance. Yeah, 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 we can replay that. So yeah, this is, uh, this is payback for all the presentations that he's put retarded pictures of me in there. I just like to, I like to thank my coworkers for making, for being very diligent and making sure that this stuff is recorded and archived so we can bring it back to haunt him later. So, so I mean, that's, it's a work in progress. I'm still working on it. Um, I'm going to be sharing the code here in a few weeks and stuff so people, other people can work on it too. Other people can take a look at it and see if they can help me out. I'm not a C guy. I just learned C to do this type of stuff. So, I mean, I know there's C gurus out there that can help me out. I mean, tell me what I'm doing wrong. Tell me what I'm doing right. You know, tell me that I'm a complete piece of shit and why, why did I waste your time? That's fine. So. But pretty much any questions, other than why Dave has water on his shirt, because he drools a little bit. <laughs> yeah? Can you implement a USB hub in the 10C? Can I implement a USB hub in the 10C? Um, <laughs> Thanks for the support, Dave. Like I said, this is payback for all the presentations. I actually had to punch Dave a few times in the chest at B-Sides because of the pictures that he was putting in, my pre in the presentation that we were giving. So I don't know if anyone saw those, B those pictures, but um, I've deleted them, so you won't find them. Probably you will, just Google me. So, uh, but can you do a hub? Can you use a hub with the 10 That was your question? Uh, yeah, you can use a hub with the 10 uh, That's actually how I pulled the practical joke on one of my coworkers is I just um, soldered it directly into a hub. And so uh, we have these Dell keyboards that have hubs integrated into them. Um, so we just soldered it directly in there, uh, put, took off the back, put it in there. So it was hidden, no one knew it was in there, so it didn't look any different to them. Uh, but for this attack vector, yeah, you can definitely use it for that, and it would work. So I was actually asking, could you use the TNC to be a hub? Oh, could you use the TNC to be a hub? Yeah, that's, uh, that's where I'm trying to learn this stuff and understand, and that's where I gotta look through the USB protocol to see if it's possible. Have you asked, have you asked Paul? Um, the guy that um, sells the Tensi devices is Paul, uh, I forget what his name, pjrc.com. Uh, he's a guy that actually writes a lot of Arduino libraries. Uh, he's written the, I think the SD library, the keyboard library, and all these libraries that are already included. So he's one of the, he's pretty big in the scene and he, um, he would probably know. 
Uh, and I think that I'll probably have to end up contacting him to figure it out. But that's a good idea, I, and I'll, I'll follow up with that. Does anyone have any other questions? Yes. Why is the SD card read only? Because uh, because it's implemented in uh, the HID form. So in HID, you, when you're using it as a human interface device, there's very, very, very limited interaction that the computer can do with the HID. Pretty much just enumerating lights on the keyboard itself. So if you can think of a really like super elite hacker way of moving data back to the SD card that way, then you're better than me. Well, if we use it as a serial communication, then no, no. The, the keyboard has to accept from the computer. Right. Turn on the LED, right. Right. Well, then we're limited by the drivers on the on the operating system, and since we're using drivers that are already part built in with the operating system, Microsoft's provided them. Whoever in Linux, you know, Apple's provided them. I don't know of any functionality inside those that will be able to do that. Right. Yeah, I, we're send, essentially sending Morse code back to the computer, or back to the SD card. And I mean, at, with the keyboard as is right now, you can only send 500 keystrokes a second, which is pretty slow. 500 bytes a second is not very fast. So I mean, talk about you know reducing that down to one byte a second, and it's just it, in theory, yes, you could do practicality. It's not it's not worth trying. So any other questions? Yes, you in the red shirt. For the cheap seats. Yeah, uh, yes. Now you're a key logger as well. I was trying to do that. I had to go into his uh, PS2 library to mm -hmm. do some massive changes to see extra characters. Yeah, we had to end up going into the library, and it was, it was a pain in the butt. So um, I can talk with you more about it offline. So, Because I don't have the code with me. It's on a workstation back in the office. Uh, I will put it on release, but mine, keep in mind, it's not totally functioning yet. It's kind of a pain to use it all. That's what I mean. You're probably further ahead than I am. I, I just got some concepts working, so I was able to see like you know certain characters and stuff like that, and I was able to interject some stuff. Part of the control is to make the USB side of that a lot easier. Also, you want to do USB key logger. Oh, that would be great because yeah, I, that's the problem is that so the, one of the problems right now with the keyboard logger and injection attack vector is that that attack vector relies on a PS2 keyboard because that's what the libraries are built around. The libraries are built around PS2 keyboards because it's very simple and easy to do. The USB keyboard, um, as I found out trying to do this stuff uh, in the libraries itself, is a complete pain in the ass and I wish I never had opened it up. So any other questions? All right, I guess there's no more questions. Thank you for the thank you for attending. Why why am I leaving this up, Dave? Don't unplug your laptop. Why am I leaving this up, Dave? Because we need to do some stuff. No, you realize he's my boss, Dave. Who's blacked out in that picture? Someone else that can get me fired. <laughs>